Here's a quick review of these enthalpy graphs. And again, enthalpy is just a fancy word for energy changes, often associated with a chemical reaction. All right, so they're going to want me to label a few parts to this graph. The reactants are always at the beginning. The products are always at the end. The activation energy is the energy required to get to that point where we have sufficient energy for the chemical products to be formed. We need to break bonds on the reactant side. We need to overcome those repulsive forces of negative electron clouds. We always need to add a little boost of energy, even though the reaction may end up being spontaneous in the end. On an exothermic graph like this one, activation energy is this little bump on the top, E sub A. So it looks like I have to add about 10 kilojoules of energy to get the reaction started. But then once it's started, this reaction will progress on its own. And the last thing we want to label is the heat of reaction. That will be the difference between the energy level of the products and the reactants. Whoa, I can draw a straight line. So maybe somewhere in here, delta H R X M. Difference between the energy level of the reactants and products. If they want me to calculate the heat of reaction, then we just pull those numbers off the graph. So we'd have uh, energy level of the products minus total heat energy level of the reactants. That equals my overall energy change for the chemical reaction. So what do we got here? Maybe like, ooh, interesting. 15 kilojoules minus 40 kilojoules. Or in other words, a negative 25 kilojoules as my overall net change between the reactants and the products. Which kind of answers number three. Is this endothermic or exothermic? Exothermic, baby. Exothermic. And I can tell in a couple ways. Uh, number one, I have a negative delta H. Number two, you could just look at the shape of the graph. The products are at a lower energy level. If the products are formed at a lower energy level, it must mean that energy was released. All right, and the last two. What is activation energy and how much is needed for this particular reaction? Okay, there's a couple purposes for activation energy. One of them, we need to overcome repulsion of negative electron clouds. Sometimes energy is needed to break bonds on the reactant side. We might need to break reactant bonds. And breaking bonds will always require energy. Anytime you want to break apart things that are attracted to each other, you need to add energy. Then once I break the bonds of the reactants, I want to rearrange those atoms to make new bonds on the product side. And that's where we need to overcome the repulsion of the negative electron clouds. All atoms are surrounded by negative electron clouds. So the first time that I start bringing them together, there will be that repulsive force. So we need that little kick in the pants, a little boost of energy to overcome the repulsion. And then once we bring the nuclei close enough to the electron clouds, there will be attraction. Electrons can be transferred or shared. And we can form stable bonds in the products. How much is needed in this particular reaction? Just the size of that little bump up there. How about 10 kilojoules for this particular reaction? 
And finally, is this reaction likely to be spontaneous? You betcha. Yes. Because it is exothermic. Exothermic reactions are typically spontaneous. Once you get them started, they'll produce energy that kind of sustains the reaction, keeps it going. 